one of the most recent giants in the history of painting. Pierre Soulages is, without any doubt, the greatest living French painter. Soon to reach the age of 95, he is one of the very few artists to open a gallery bearing his name. For the public, his painting is the incarnation of one color, black. His immense body of work is today made up of more than 1,550 paintings made with this pigment in all its variants. Intense, powerful paintings that reveal an incredible quest, the adventure of a life. That of a man who had tirelessly sought to bring forth light from the darkness. Through the strength of the reflections on his painting surfaces, the transform our view through the strong contrasting power of the black, which illuminates all other colors, even the darkest. In Pierre Soulages' paintings, black introduces us to unexpected possibilities. Black is no longer just black. The painting by Solage is a punch in the stomach. It's true. To see it, you have to lower your gaze, as if you were lowering your weapon. Now, if you accept being unarmed, you will experience the shock. But if you hide in your shell saying, doesn't look like anything, or that looks like something else, you will look instead of seeing, and you won't experience the emotion. You're standing in front of a black painting. You ask yourself, is it art? What is it? Since that is the very question raised by the anti-image, in principle, we think of art as an image. I saw the works, the characters. I was immediately struck by something. It was this type of evidence of radicalism. I thought to myself, it's easy to do, but impossible to do. These paintings are still unsettling. I was all struck by the number of people who would cry in front of his paintings. I remember in 1996 at the exhibition in the city's art gallery, there was a young girl who would come every Friday and cry for three hours. And since I went there often, I would see her. She went away and she came back and cried. It conveyed a very strong emotion. Let go before this painting, where the stakes lie in the head-to-head -head with the spectator, in a confrontation with the light, with the material, which is striped, smooth, even engraved. Pierre Soulage has, his whole life, been guided by a radical, broken line. He has invented painting without words, freed from all portrayal, any representation, even any interpretation. The seul être vivant qui peigne, c'est l'homme. The only living beings that paint are humans. And what's more, for hundreds of centuries, hundreds, they went down to the darkest parts of the earth, down into caves, into the absolute darkness of the caves to paint. And they painted using black. This is very surprising, because there is white stone all over the place to make marks with, and not just chalk. The original color of painting is black. I also wondered if black is not also the color of our origins. When a child is born, we say, he first saw the light of day on such a date, which means that, yes, before that, he was in darkness.
In an attempt to understand the paintings of Pierre Soulages, we must start with the formative years of his childhood in Aveyron. The artist is still very fond of this arid land that marked him for life. It was in this environment that he built himself a library of very personal references. Pierre Soulages came from the town of Rodez, a small provincial town that was, at that time, very isolated, far from Paris. From a very young age, he forged his own independence of spirit, a real taste for freedom. He was born on the 24th of December 1919 at 4 Rue Combarel, in this house which remains unchanged. Pierre Soulages spent a somewhat solitary childhood there. His sister was 15 years older. His parents, modest artisans, worked a lot. His mother ran a fishing tackle shop. His father, a coach builder, repaired horse carts, which were still very much in use at that time. From when he started school, the young Pierre set himself apart from the other children with one founding act. Je me suis senti libre, toujours. Mais de... parce que je me suis senti d'abord prisonnier. I've always felt free because I started out feeling like a prisoner. When I was five years old, I ran away. I ran away because I was punished at the private school I attended. It was the St. Joseph School. My friends were playing in the schoolyard, and I was on my own, on my knees, copying into an exercise book, doing lines or something. I couldn't stand it anymore, and I left. I ran away. I crossed the town on my own, when normally I was held by the hand and taken to school and later picked up, and I never returned to that school. My father was still alive then. My father died when I was five years old. It's one of the last times I brought him joy, because he was so happy, it seemed, that I was brave enough to do that. His father, impressed by his young son's act of rebellion, died a few months later. This personality trait, this taste for independence, would never leave Pierre Soulages. His father died when he was five years old, and at that time, the two women in the life of Pierre Soulages, his mother and older sister, who was 15 or 20 years older than him, dressed in black. So he lived with these ladies, black crepe and black dresses. Black was a permanent theme in his life. Solitary and independent, the young Pierre got on his bike and cycled to the banks of the river Aveyron to go fishing. What was especially uncommon at that age, Pierre Soulage loved going on long walks in the surrounding course. He was fascinated by these austere landscapes, the starkness, the vast horizons, the large empty plateaus. He loved their vastness, which for him held a real taste of freedom. It was a feeling that contrasted with the oppression that he felt in Rodez, in the street where he was born. The window of his bedroom looked onto the wall of a hospital. His only views were walls. The street for him represented a sort of imprisonment. It must be noted all the same that it was very distinctive. On the street, opposite the house in which he lived, there was a hospital, a court, a prison, a convent, all aspects of the world that face imprisonment. On the one hand, there is this succession of very austere buildings where, I would say, the public and locals could not enter, or at least if they did enter. If it was the hospital, then they were probably ill, and at that time, that meant that they were almost at death's door. To escape this feeling of imprisonment, the young Soulage went over to visit the artisans who worked in the adjoining street. Very curious by nature, he spent many hours watching them work. Each 
Every day he listened to the sound of the hammers, he watched the tailor draw, and as he said, he was fascinated by the tailor who would draw out the shapes on the pieces of fabric for the clothes that had been ordered. He is a very curious person, and so when he approached an artisan, a worker, essentially straight away, and I'm exaggerating slightly here, he wanted to know how things worked. He's able to talk about the tools for other jobs in an extremely precise way. He told me one day how a barrel is made. You can almost actually make a barrel after a lesson from Pierre Soulage. He was particularly fascinated by the work of the cabinet maker. Pierre Soulage dissected his techniques, his precious know-how. Later on, he would maintain this taste for making his own tools. It was at that time that he discovered walnut stain, a mixture used to paint wooden planks. It was a simple and rustic material that would play an important role in the painter's future career. But at that time, the young Pierre may well have been fascinated by this manual work, but he did not dream of a career as an artisan. That wasn't free enough for his taste. He found artisan craft work to be too confined to the art of its execution, constrained by mastering the technique. Pierre Soulage already preferred the freedom of drawing, but he even stood out in this area. He did not draw exactly like a normal child. When he returned from school, he was alone at home. His sister was 15 years older, and she had already left to study elsewhere. She wanted to be a philosophy teacher. He lived alone with his mother, and so in his bedroom on Rue Combarel, he sat in front of his exercise book and dipped a brush into his ink and spread the black ink over the white. His sister came home with a girlfriend and asked him, what are you painting, young Pierre? And he answered, the snow. Of course, I've made everyone laugh, but it's a laugh that he still remembers because it highlights the very paradox of all his paintings, meaning black, yes, but for the light. He painted the snow in the sense that the black made the white of the snow stand out. The strength of black already. Yet Pierre Soulage would not go on to discover his vocation as an artist until some years later. His first ascetic flutters did not come from painting, but through architecture. First of all, there was Rodez Cathedral, this impressive mass of stone that stood out like a signal when he set out on his walks alone. A presence. He liked the starkness of its facade with no entrance, the beauty of this plain wall, like a blank page. The plain wall of Rodez Cathedral. Do not even touch it. The plain wall. Those were my first emotions, my first artistic horizons. There was Conch, the architecture of Conch, the light of Conch. His vocation as an artist became clear here when he discovered the Romanesque Abbey of Conch, built between the 11th and 12th century. It is located 30 kilometers from Rodez. His aesthetic shock happened during a school trip when Pierre Soulage was just 12 years old. His French teacher or history teacher took them by coach to Conch and he was totally astounded by the architecture there. This masterpiece of Roman architecture fascinated him, particularly the austerity that prevailed in Cistercian tradition. Walls free from any decoration, any statues, leaving way just for the variations in the light that penetrate the areas for contemplation, changing through every hour of the day displaying little to highlight the riches of everything there is to see. This principle would guide his work. From this day, Pierre Soulage wanted to dedicate his life to art. He had found his vocation. At that point, he decided to be a painter. 
I've often asked him, why a painter? You could have been an architect or a sculptor, a painter, because, as he told me, I've always painted. He is absolutely fascinated by the architecture of Conk, and it's rather interesting to see how architecture can feed into the vocation of a painter. And that's why his painting is very structured, in a certain way. Throughout his adolescence, Pierre Soulage painted every day. The young Pierre's paintings did not yet resemble the Soulage that we know today, as you can see in these few paintings that were preserved from that time. They were figurative, like these landscapes of trees that he painted at the age of 14. The second type of drawings from which he had a predilection, because he had drawn all his life, of course, were trees. But he drew the skeleton of the trees, the emaciated trees of the winter. A tree in winter, as Pierre Soulage would later explain, is a sort of abstract sculpture. These bare trees that stand out from the landscape and the contours of the branches already seem to show a structured form of painting, exalting the colour black. The young Pierre Soulage deeply loved to paint, so he wanted to find a way of earning his living that would leave him time to paint. Everyone can draw, but not everyone can draw well. And it's true that everyone could see he had a gift for drawing, which is where the idea came from, with encouragement from his sister and then his mother, to say, since you draw well, and a few teachers also encouraged it, why don't you become an art teacher? To be a teacher was the best job at that time. In September 1938, he moved to Paris to study to become an art teacher. Here are the paintings that he did at that time. He had just turned 18 years old. As a very promising student, his teacher had ambitions for him. He wanted him to go to the School of Fine Arts. The Prix de Rome was in his sights. A future as an official painter held its arms outstretched. His teacher, Jodon, suggested he should apply to the School of Fine Arts, even though he was working towards something else. He identified his skills and he suggested that he apply to the School of Fine Arts. And he was accepted. He was admissible and then admitted. But when he went there to sit the admission, he walked through the School of Fine Arts, he saw the students' work, and it repulsed him. He hated that type of thing, and he decided to return to Rodez without studying at the School of Fine Arts in Paris. Up until the last few decades, fine arts were taught in an extremely traditional, extremely academic way. Painters worthy of the name found this teaching very restrictive and outside of their frame of reference. So there are many artists throughout history who enrolled in fine arts but never stepped foot inside, or who left the School of Fine Arts immediately. The School of Fine Arts was undoubtedly, at that time, light years away from what a painter like him could have been looking for. Pierre Soulage was too free-spirited to be enclosed within this temple of academicism. So he would never become an art teacher. Freedom is something that really strikes you when you look at the path of Pierre Soulage because his references were very quickly not those of the dominant culture. He had spent part of his existence fighting against everything he had learned. I don't think that he actually had to fight in reality because that must have been a natural inclination for him. But when he advises young painters today or young artists, he suggests that they should forget everything they have learned to return to their own emotions. But for him, that seems to be almost natural. During the war in the region of Montpellier, the young Soulage became resistant. He avoided the obligatory work imposed by the Germans. During this turbulent period, he did not paint, but he perfected his own apprenticeship, established his own imaginary museum, his own reference points. 
He particularly spent time at the Musée Fabre Montpellier, where a few paintings resonated deeply with him. Campagna's Descent from the Cross, a painting from the 16th century. He was most interested by the painter's pictorial choices rather than by the subject itself, particularly how the shapes had been organized, strengthened by contrasts. The characters grouped together as a structure are somber and contrast against the light background. Or the painting of Saint Agatha by Francisco de Souberon from the 17th century. This time, he was fascinated by the clothes, particularly by their color, which was illuminated by the dark background. The black accentuated the brilliance of all the other colors. The Musée Fabre was a museum that offered Solage, as a young painter, an array of works. Certain ones certainly bored him, and others, on the contrary, profoundly stimulated him. Particularly Courbet, who is an important painter at the Musée Fabre, and who worked the paint in a way that spoke to Solage, clearly. So it is clear today that he is closer to Courbet than to a painter who created very refined works. Courbet was a painter who gives the impression of having taken the earth and placed it on a canvas. Zubron, you can also understand why, with the violent contrasts of color. It was at that time that he would have a fateful encounter at the School of Fine Arts in Montpellier, where he had decided to take a few classes. She was a young student called Colette. The two of them were in their 20s, but they would never again leave each other's side. They met at school. In fact, they met at the School of Fine Arts in Montpellier, on the benches at the School of Fine Arts. As is often the case, it was her that chose him, not because he was the boy on the course who was the best looking, although, in my opinion, she didn't say he wasn't, but he has to have been the best looking, but she chose the most talented. She looked at his drawings and he seemed the most interesting. She sat next to him and I think that same evening or the following day, they went together to the Musée Fabre, where they discovered they had the same tastes. They spent a lot of time together at the museum. It really was a case of total elective affinities. It really was a good match. Colette and Soulage are an astonishing couple. Even more so given that Soulage is very tall and Colette is very petite. They met in 1941 and around Easter time in 1942, they got engaged and they were married in October. They got married in black at midnight. Married at the age of 22, the young couple shared the same tastes. They liked the same painters, such as Gustave Courbet. But most importantly, they were in intellectual symbiosis. They particularly held the same view on the history of art, which was very individual at that time. You can't think of Solage without thinking of Colette. And Colette, at that time, was interested in and already writing about a subject that concerned her, which was, what is the history of art? For Pierre Soulage, the history of art as it was taught to him was seriously truncated. It was a belief forged from his youth when he discovered that art originated in prehistoric times. He was particularly astounded when he saw this menhir for the first time at the Musée Fenay in Rodez. It came from a very distant past, sculpted from blocks of sandstone 5,000 years earlier by prehistoric men. Without knowing their significance, the religious signs or myths upon which they were based, they still had the power to create a strong emotional reaction in the young Pierre Soulage. On est face à des... We're looking at sculptures that are about 5,000 years old, which represent men and women. It's the start of bas-relief sculpture, and sometimes we find that this seemingly awkward size, the encounter, can be very powerful. They are sculptures that are rather stirring, because we can almost read every trace of the tools used. 
We could, if we take our time, see the different successive removals that make these forms emerge from the surface of the sculptures, of the monuments. Nothing is hidden. Everything can be seen and everything is revealed. Pierre Soulage understood that if these statues could reach us independently of when and where they were created, then a work of art exists above all through the people viewing it. Le jeune Pierre Soulage, qui avait peut-être une vingtaine d'années, quand il les a. The young Pierre Soulage in his twenties, who rubbed shoulders with them, must have been struck both by this monumental quality and the power that emerges from these sculptures. And we can also find in his first works, particularly in his engraved work, this frontality that features in the Meniers, which we find in his first works. Moved by these traces left by the first artists, Pierre Soulage would even take part in excavations on the course with the archaeologist Louis Bolson. This is him here in the center of the photo in the Gage region, where he exhumed a prehistoric burial ground in search of artifacts. He gifted them to the Musée Fenay in Rodez. As such, the first time his name appeared in a museum was with objects found in megalithic tombs. This anecdote is far from insignificant, since for Pierre Soulage, prehistory holds a vital place in the history of art. He asked himself, what is this all about? They tell us about Grecian art from 1500 years ago, but wait, before that there were caves at least 20,000 or 30,000 years ago. And that, I think in the context of the region of Rodez, with the course, with his archaeological discovery, was something that would influence him a great deal and almost prove him right. The history of art does not date back 20 centuries, the history of art dates back 380 centuries. It dates back to the first inscriptions that were found on cave walls. It dates from parietal art. And he thought, my fascination for art, is this fascination? He was aware of it from a very, very young age, and so was Colette. For him, it brought back his discoveries from school a few years earlier. At the age of 16, he had been astounded by the drawings of bison in Altamira. They were the first prehistoric cave paintings to be discovered at the end of the 19th century. It's the story of a formation and the discovery of the cave of Altimira in a document that his art teacher had given him was very important. With the famous bounding bison that absolutely astounded Solage. What would subconsciously strike him very early on in this prehistoric painting was precisely that they were anything but refined, elegant. They had a completely direct pictorial presence, like a slap in the face, without needing the decorum required by certain periods in the history of art that would be used and abused, with sometimes plenty of talent, but lacking their own story. From that time on, essentially, what he says now is the prehistoric painters are his real brothers in painting. They are the closest to him. They are his real family, as he says. That is where, in any case, he discovered the first painters. When I noticed that all of the history of art that they told us about or showed us was from recent centuries, the few centuries featured in museums, when I saw a reproduction of the bison of Altimira, a prehistoric work with the date below, 18,000 years, 
and I painstakingly converted that into centuries. I thought, but that's 180 centuries. Socrates, Plato, they were 25 centuries ago, and this is 180? Now we know that it's 340 centuries with the Chauvet cave. I found that it's important to think about the human activity that is painting. The young Pierre Soulage therefore had a vision of art that was individual for his time, but he still had to free himself from one constraint to be the great painter he would become, to abandon figurative representation. Everything clicked into place in 1942 by chance when he discovered abstract art, which received little coverage at that time. The discovery happened at the hairdressers when he was flicking through the collaborative review signal. Between the Nazi propaganda and fashionable photo reports, he discovered an article dedicated to art. The text spoke of a loathing for modern art which was presented as decadent. It was illustrated by paintings by artists exiled to the United States, such as Marc Chagall or Fernand Léger, presented as a degenerative and disgusting style of painting. Ironically, in the young reader, this evoked the opposite effect. Pierre Soulage was astonished by the abstraction of a Montréal painting. This discovery offered him new creative perspectives. La découverte de Mondrian, uh... His discovery of Mondrian at the hairdressers in a collaborative review criticizing degenerative art, he saw that abstract art exists, so it all became intertwined. And this is a paradox because it was an article that denounced, even loathed modern art, that gave him a taste for it. And so, too bad for them, or all the better. After the war, the young man could finally dedicate himself to his art. He was ready to invent a radically new style of painting. In 1946, the Soulages moved to the outskirts of Paris, to Courbevoie. His art studio took up part of two rooms. His father-in-law may well have offered him a great situation, to join the family import-export business but the desire to paint was stronger than everything. His first paintings were incongruous. Pierre Soulage had definitively said goodbye to figurative painting. His works were abstract. If the form of the tree from the paintings of his youth seemed to reappear behind these great structures, the artist contested it. His painting did not refer to an image, a sign, a tree, or a Chinese ideogram. Pierre Soulage likes to say that he does not represent. He presents. He does not paint a picture, but he paints. His well-structured compositions with long, dark lines were made with a material that is unique within the history of art, walnut stain, that he discovered as a child with the artisans. He would decide to paint with this basic, cheap material, which is not an artist's material, and to work with this unconventional material, he would use tools that are not overly conventional. He would use tools for painting buildings. He would use flat masonry brushes. He would immediately do something completely different. We call it black and white when, in reality, Wood stain is almost black, but still, that's one of the secrets of the beauty of this work. It's the variety of colors within the same tones. The variety of tonal values within the wood stain is extraordinary. We can go from almost black to red-brown to brown to light ochre. La peinture de Soulage, c'est une peinture Solage's painting, he paints with large strokes, big movements. These large strokes, with the large brushes, with the very violent strokes between color and lack of color, white, 
It all contributes to making a painting that is quickly distinguished from all others and will very quickly be noted as such and a certain compliance occurs with this way of painting. Pierre Soulage was noticed at his first joint exhibition at the Salon des Sœurs Indépendants in Paris in 1947 at the Parc des Expositions. At the age of 27, he was one of the youngest exhibitors. His large, dark paintings would catch the eye of one of the great names in the art world, Francis Picabia. This master was at that time more than 70 years old. His highly colorful art was not closely related to that of the younger painter, but he wanted to meet him as soon as possible to encourage him. Soulage soon met with Picabia. Picabia liked his work and said to Soulage, Young Soulage, I am going to tell you what Pissarro himself said to me about my work. With the way that you paint, you will quickly make enemies. In other words, you're better than the others and people will get jealous of you. He identified this very quickly. Picabia was very important to him, not because of how Picabia painted, but for the fact that Picabia was a well-known painter who recognized him. He had the opportunity to be recognized early on by people that mattered. For Pierre Soulage, this encouragement felt almost like being knighted. Recognized by artists, public success would come from abroad. Firstly, from Germany, where in 1948, Pierre Soulage was invited together with some great names from the art world to the first large exhibition of abstract art. Surprise, one of his walnut stain pieces was chosen for the poster. It played a pivotal role in the international recognition of the young Pierre Soulage. From then on, painters passing through Paris would meet in the new Soulage Atelier en Rue Chalcher in Paris. But it was especially the Americas that interested him. One day, an elegant man with a strong American accent arrived unexpectedly in his atelier. This stranger was none other than James Johnson Sweeney, the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA, who several years earlier had discovered the artist then presented as the greatest American painter, Jackson Pollock, and his drip paintings. Sweeney immediately bought a walnut stain painting. And Soulage, afterwards a friend told him, but wait, he's a considerable authority in New York. And he was soon invited to joint exhibitions in the United States. And then in 1953, he was approached by a very big dealer, Sam Kutz, who's one of the biggest dealers in New York, who displayed particularly Picasso and many American painters, and who would then dedicate an exhibition to him every year from 1954 to 1966. From this moment on, he was an important character in New York, and his exhibitions were seen by every painter. That's what matters, for collectors also. In 1957, when Pierre Soulage crossed the Atlantic for the first time and discovered New York's skyscrapers, he was on that side of the ocean, a real star. The big American collectors liked his large abstract works. They featured in collections at the biggest museums, such as the MoMA or the Guggenheim. Much more famous in the United States than in his own country, the painter's work, while remaining faithful to his principles, evolved without cease. In the 1960s, after the large structured paintings, he now painted large layers of black across the surface, illuminated with flashes of white, even color. He had to wait until 1967, 20 years into his career, for France to finally deign to dedicate his first large exhibition to him. It was held at the National Museum of Modern Art, which at that time was located in the Palais de Tokyo. 
At the age of 47, Pierre Soulage was presented as the ambassador of contemporary French art and was finally recognized in France as a painter that mattered. The galleries of the National Museum of Modern Art in Paris on the Avenue du Président Wilson are dedicated until the 21st of April to the presentation of the works of the painter Solage, one of the youngest contemporary painters to receive this honor. Solage has already achieved exceptional notoriety on an international scale for an artist of less than 50 years old. The painter, always dressed in black, became a public figure he started to generate intrigue. Reports were made about him. Is it easy to start painting? No. No. I always wait a very, very long time. You hover over it? Yes. I put the canvas on the wall. Then I look at it. I sit next to it. I pull away as soon as I try and start it. I smoke, I choose colors, I touch the brushes, and sometimes I do nothing. But there was no question of seeing him paint. Pierre Soulage cannot bear creating a work in front of observers. Any presence would influence his painting too much. It would guide his work, which would then become, in his eyes, false. He's never let anyone, not even Colette, see him paint even once. He would not accept that anyone should see him paint. He can only paint alone. The exhibitionism of the act of painting for him has nothing to do with the painting. The painting is the finished item. This is one of the rare times that he has let anyone film him preparing a painting. For Pierre Soulage, painting means pouring, scratching, brushing or etching. In the studio, numerous tools, paintbrushes, brushes and scrapers and all sorts of strange instruments that the artist sometimes made himself after in his youth, spending a lot of time with the artisans, learning their techniques. And when he was not satisfied with a painting, he didn't hesitate to burn it. Pierre Encrevet experienced this, and he still has a burning memory from it. We were preparing an exhibition at the Centre Pompidou. I went to set, I found a dozen paintings, all absolutely sublime, and I said, very good, you can bring them, we'll show them to Alfred Pacmont, and if you want, we'll display them in the exhibition. And when he came back in November, I asked him, have you got the paintings? He replied, no, I burned them. So you see, he didn't like them. And I thought they were magnificent. Pierre Soulage likes to say, it's what I do that teaches me what I'm looking for. And what he was looking for, he often found by accident. Like one night in January 1979, which would revolutionize his painting for the rest of his life. Ça se passe au 79. It happened in 1979. He was in his studio. He was struggling. We'll tell it as it was. He was working at night. He was struggling. He realized that he was applying more and more black that was covering the painting. We can say that the black was starting to reign supreme. And so he said to himself, OK, this isn't working. I'll stop. He turned out the light and went to bed. And the next morning he arrived, turned on the light, and suddenly he realized the effect of the light on the black paint. So he realized that this light is changing and it grants the paint a sort of presence that he hadn't imagined before. So from there on, he slightly reconfigured not the motifs in his painting, but his way of working so as to always play this game of ping pong between the black and the light. The public would discover these stunning paintings for the first time a few months later, at an exhibition at the recently opened Centre Pompidou, where Pierre Soulage had covered the whole surface in black. But black is not only black. Thanks to the play on the reflections in the light, he baptized these paintings the Outre Noir, meaning beyond the black.
like a new territory. I call it Autre Noir because it's a word that I created and I invented this word to differentiate from what we call Noir Lumière, black light. But Noir Lumière is clearly the light reflected by the black, by the state of the surface of the black, different from elsewhere. When black is striped, the black does not reflect in the same way as when it is smooth. But Noir Lumière is an optical decision, while Outre Noir is something else. It is the mental realm that we inhabit when we like a work of art. When a work of art touches us, it is something much more complex, something that happens inside ourselves. That is called the mental realm. In 1979, this exhibition staged this outre noir with an unexpected way of hanging the works, positioned in space, attached to cables between the floor and the ceiling a spatial pathway obliging the visitor to circulate between them and to multiply the viewing angles. But this was absolutely not a whim because from 1979 until now there have been 35 years of revolutions through his Outre Noir paintings. In his Outre Noir there are 10,000 Outre Noirs. This means that they are linked through a relationship with the materials between matte black, gloss black, black with stripes, black with lines, very structured black, with a knife, bars, with successions of materials. So his creativity is linked to the material. During the following three decades, Pierre Soulages' pictorial research has been exclusively based on these same foundations. A single pigment, black, with alternate interventions, either smooth and flat, or striped or etched with multiple variants. An era started in 1979 that was not broken, apart from one digression of eight years that he dedicated to what may appear to be a return to his origins. In 1986, Pierre Soulage received a request he could not refuse because it was to create stained glass windows for the Abbey of Conque. The place that inspired his vocation as an artist when he was just a child. Conque would become the scene of his biggest masterpiece, the highlight of his career. Pierre Soulage dedicated eight years of his life to it, a period during which he would paint much less. Because the artist could not find the glass that he wanted, a glass that could simultaneously lengthen the wall, cut the exterior view, and offer natural light. So he would invent it. The stained glass windows were installed in 1994. Contrary to rumor, they were not, of course, black. Proof, if it was required, that it was a quest for light that drove Pierre Soulage. These windows would allow his work to be reinterpreted. The 104 windows are formed of large parallel bands of the same width that formally recall the large strokes of his Outre Noir paintings. Thanks to their translucent material, the bays seem to produce their own light. Viewed from the outside, the windows reflect the light of the sky like opaque mirrors, becoming as impenetrable as the stone facade. On the inside, the colors evolve according to the time of day, thus marking the passage of time, which takes on its own meaning in this place of contemplation. Once again, by reducing the means used, the artist succeeded in revealing the infinite richness of the light. Pierre Soulage had completed his life's masterpiece. He was then aged 75. The circle was complete, as so rarely happens for an artist. In his hometown, echoing Rodez Cathedral, just a few hundred meters from the street where Pierre Soulage spent his childhood, 
the museum that bears his name was built. For this building, the architecture is a metaphor for his art. This painting of the light and of the material. The museum is constructed using large monoliths whose raw cotton steel walls evoke the tones of the famous walnut stain used by the artist. A few weeks before it opened to the public on the 31st of May 2014, the workers were busy setting up the some 500 pieces in this museum, paintings granted by Pierre and Colette Soulage as a donation to the town of Rodez. Like nowhere else, it was a matter of hanging a life's work. The artist insisted that among his paintings, visitors should discover the preparatory works for the stained glass windows at the Abbey of Conques. Life-sized cardboard templates, four meters in height. From the bright artificial light in some rooms to the almost darkness of other spaces, the pathway is designed according to the changing light, sometimes even according to the time of day. A notion that is so dear to the artist particularly in the rooms in which his large Outre Noir paintings are displayed. The pathways allow the progression of the artist's thought process to be captured. Before Outre Noir, the large paintings with striking contrasts or even the famous walnut stains from the start of his career. The works of his youth are not forgotten. Some of the paintings from his childhood are even on display for the first time. In the same way that Pierre Soulage was naturally involved in the conception of this building that was designed by a Spanish agency, he monitored very closely how the works were hung. The staging of each painting, where its lighting was of paramount importance. We're going to do it now with the guys. There it's 33-33. I said 35. Or 32, is it okay there? That's 32, 32. We won't change the one on the right, but we'll move the one on the left. In this meticulous work, Pierre Soulage is more often than not accompanied by his wife, Colette, who has been by his side now for 73 years. Pierre, we're going to do one thing. We have some white there. We're going to bring the white down, OK? Ah, yes, that's much better. It's much better like that. Look. You get the white in your eyes there. I can see the bottom. You can see it well, that's for sure. <laughs> I think we need to maybe hide the white at the top. The white at the top might be too high because it brings... That will work anyway. OK, so we'll take it there now. Pierre, we're going to take it there into the other room, OK? Because they don't want us to juggle with it. That's not daylight? No, it's not. So, Pierre, we're going to set up the five as we saw them with the lady this morning to see if they need to be moved left or right. Very well. 
This polyptych will be suspended from cables in levitation, like at the exhibition in the Centre Pompidou in 1979. As you move, you no longer see the same painting. For Pierre Soulage, it is fundamental that the audience should be free to enjoy their own experience of the paintings. The artist has dedicated his life to this quest for freedom. When we say that these paintings are black, you see black in your mind. That's all I want. But you are alone with your thoughts in front of whatever you're looking at. And what you are looking at does not take you back to a past experience, nor anything other than what it is.